This right here is the H510 motherboard. Now, this has a big difference compared to the last generation H410, and that is it supports 3200 MHz. However, a big question you guys had for me was, does it support 10th gen with 3200 MHz? So we'll put that to the test very soon, but I also wanted to talk about testing this with an 11400F with 3600 MHz memory versus 3200 MHz memory, where I still think that 3200 MHz, and especially a kit like this, which is a 16 gigabyte 2x8 kit, represents some of the best value. So if we take the H510 motherboard, which on the surface is already looking like it's good value for money, and then we take the 3200 MHz kit that we just had, and we couple that with say an 11400F, is that going to be some of the best value in terms of building a new gaming PC that you can get out there on the market? Well then there is only one way to find out, and that is conduct some tests. So here's the ASRock H510M ITX AC. So this is an ITX motherboard on H510, which I picked up for 139 Aussie dollars, which honestly for an ITX board with the specs that it's boasting, does look like it's extremely good value for money. However, there is one key difference that we have to be careful of, and I was told this before the launch of the 11th gen CPUs, and that is with H510 motherboards, the PCB layer has to be six layers in order to support 3200 megahertz. If you only have a four layer PCB, then unfortunately you are limited to 2933 MHz. So upon booting up the PC and jumping straight into the BIOS with the 10th gen chip, there is unfortunately some bad news and that is the maximum speed here is 2666. So that seems to be an issue with the CPU itself and the firmware that Intel implements on their 10th gen CPUs in that they will require a Z series motherboard to unlock the higher memory speeds. So that is some unfortunate news, but let's change over now to the 11400F. After, of course, we do some quick benchmarking. So we just finished benchmarking the i5-10600 and we've done that in a variety of benchmarks. However, what we have in now is the i5-11400F and ironically enough, the H410 motherboard isn't the problem in the case of unlocking memory speeds and especially having the XMP profile option. That's actually locked into the CPU communicating with the motherboard itself. So basically on both sides, that's the motherboard and the CPU side, the options have to be unlocked and then you can finally unlock that XMP profile or that particular memory speed. In this case, it happens to be 3200 megahertz that we're able to lock in with an i5-11400F and also the 3200 megahertz kit. So after conducting the benchmarks, we have three different games here across 1080p on the ultra low presets. And this is designed to stress the CPUs to their maximum. So if there is a difference when it comes to PC gaming and you are in a CPU bound scenario, then you will see that across these four different CPUs. Now you may notice that there is also different testing within the four CPUs. That is the i5-10600, the i5-10400F, the i5-11400F, and the Ryzen 5 3600. Here I wanted to paint a few different scenarios here, and especially in the case of the i5-10600, I managed to pick this up on a used deal for 150 Aussie dollars, which would be around 120 USD. Now going into F1 2020, the 11400F does pull ahead of the Ryzen 5 3600 and also the 10400F, which is an impressive showing, and this continues on with CSGO. Now the graphics card we did use for this testing was the 6900 XT, as I have been using the RTX 3080 quite a bit lately. And then when I release the video with the 11400F being the dedicated focus of the video, I will include the NVIDIA 3080 numbers with those benchmarks. Though getting back to CSGO, you may notice that just like F1 2020, there is a little bit of a discrepancy here with the 11400F numbers against the 11400F. 
we just tested on a Z590 motherboard versus a H510 motherboard. And moving to Shadow of the Tomb Raider yet again shows that although the CPU is posting out some good results, it is posting out some quite weird and conflicting results at times, depending on the set of hardware that you use. Another benchmark I'll show for you guys is the power consumption numbers, which when we look at these a little bit closer, we can see that 11400F, although it's pulling ahead on the numbers, it is using the most power out of all the four CPUs shown in today's benchmark, which means while you're gaming, you're not gonna be getting the most efficient experience. As opposed to the other three CPUs tested, they do all come in a similar league, where the 11400F is then out on a league of its own, technically, though Intel do account for this by including the all-black cooler. So you will get the all-black cooler design included with the 11400F this time around, if you decide to go with this cooler versus the 10400F, which is their old school look with the silver and black and ugly sticker in the middle that they've been using for yonder. Actually beyond yonder, I believe they've gone with this color scheme since the dark ages. So it's actually a cool thing to see that they've included this better cooler with the 11400F. However, if we contrast that to the 10th gen CPUs, I believe only the i7 and i9 CPUs that are non-K included this all black cooler design. So summing up the i5-11400F, the numbers are quite impressive, especially given its current price on the market. I believe in the USA, you can get this thing for 170 US dollars. In Australia, it's coming a little bit over 200 Aussie dollars. So it is extremely well priced. However, now it is time to talk about some of the caveats if you want to get this CPU, and that is especially coupling it with an H510 motherboard. Now, in order to get these results that I got here today, especially on the H510 numbers that you're seeing here in the graphs, I actually had to go into the BIOS and then manually tune the power settings because without the power settings, we're actually getting quite low results to the point where the 10400F was even beating this out on an H510 motherboard. And so what we have to do here is go into the power limits and make sure tower is actually disabled and then up the power limits to the maximum duration as well as the maximum wattage on this particular H510 motherboard. Now other motherboards may be different when it comes to enabling these settings, so your mileage may vary here. Another thing to be careful of is also the gear ratio settings. If you do lock in the 3200 megahertz profile, you will wanna make sure it's on the gear one, and that's to ensure you get the most FPS possible out of the 11400F. On top of all that, the CPU itself will use more power when it comes to things like gaming and also productivity. So basically where that ties in with an H510 motherboard is if you are using the cheapest of cheap H510 motherboards, then do be cautious with this CPU because it can draw over 100 watts when it comes to stress testing the CPU itself. Now the ASRock H510M ITX actually did quite impressive for handling over 100 watts. The maximum we saw was in the mid 80 degree region on the VRM, and this was in a Cinebench R20 stress test. However, if you are using the cheapest of cheap H510 motherboard, then that may come into some VRM thermal throttling, which will then reduce your results when it comes to things like gaming and productivity. But for what it's worth, this board right here actually represents phenomenally good value for money for someone who wants to especially build a mini ITX PC, and maybe go with something like the 11400F. However, the final points to talk about here was the 10400F and the 10600. Now, when I tune these CPUs, I go with the 3200 megahertz profile, I lock that in, I drop the timings down to CL14, and then because the maximum is 2666 megahertz, it doesn't make much of a difference at all for gaming. And in fact, I thought the gaming numbers on display here today from these two 10th gen CPUs were actually quite impressive. So if you can go out and find a cheap H410 motherboard and you get some cheap DDR4 memory and you find the 10400F or the 10600 or the 10500 on sale for a really good price, then don't be afraid to go with that. If you're a PC reseller, of course, you'll want to go with the 11400F or the 11700F, because let's face it, if you're reselling a PC, the consumer always wants a higher number. Higher number must mean better, right? Don't. Then the final thing to talk about is the Ryzen 5 3600. And over the course of the 10400F being released and the prices being similar and then now distorting to a quite a sizable gap, I would recommend thinking twice about getting the 3600 at the current market prices where they've gone way over their 199 MSRP where I'm seeing them available for around 240 USD. So that is a price increase of 20%. So when we grab that 20% price increase and we compare it on the 10th gen and also the, even the 11th gen F CPUs, we can see the inverse is happening and they were coming under the MSRP or at least in the 10400F's case, that was coming well under the MSRP a lot of the time. So it's a very good buy if you're on a budget and you don't care too much about the upgrade 
because I will say one thing with AMD's 5000 Ryzen series CPUs out there at the moment, they do represent a better upgrade path if you're gonna purchase a motherboard in itself. But that said, the 11400F does provide its unique advantages over the 10400F, of course, that being PCIe 4.0, and also support for higher memory speeds up to 3200 megahertz over the 2666 on budget motherboards. So summing things up quickly for you guys, the 11400F, it is a good CPU, but I don't think it's a great CPU. It will have some disadvantages going forward, even over that of the 10400F, but I thought the 10400F was the exact same scenario. It was a good CPU, but it wasn't a great CPU. It had its own disadvantages too, which I hopefully have explained in this video. However, before I get on out of here, and also if you guys enjoyed the Tech Yes content, then be sure to hit that like button for us, and also let us know in the comments section below if you have any questions about any of the parts used in today's video. I'll be sure to get back to you as soon as I can. But with that aside, we do have the question of the day here, which comes from Sage, and they ask, you need a lot of cores, and you pick the 5800 x before the 5900x that has 12 cores question mark i don't get it so basically the reason i liked the 5800x one of the reasons i liked the 5800x before we even got into the 5900x was because of the market availability the 5800x going into that review i knew it was available and one thing i do do before i do post reviews is i do check stock levels and market pricing and also gauge demand on who wants what CPUs. The 5900X, obviously from its MSRP standpoint, was a really attractive buy, but I knew straight away when I saw that CPU and its price tag for what it was giving, and also what I heard about rumors of the stock levels from retailers, I knew it was going to be one of those cases where the prices go up. And even to this date, where the question's being asked and answered right in this video, just checking actually an hour ago, the price of the 5900X has gone to levels that make it far far inferior in terms of value for money to that of the 5800X. And another few benefits for gamers with the 5800X is it is clocked higher out of the box than the 5900X, and it does have slightly lower latencies. Hope that answers that question. If you guys have stayed this far and you're enjoying that tech, yes content, then be sure to hit that sub button and just ring it. And I'll catch you in the next tech video, which will hopefully be dropping sooner than later. Peace out for now, bye. Yeah.